Hey everybody, I'm here to talk to you today about things called polar covalent bonds and nonpolar covalent bonds. After that, we'll discuss how that impacts if a molecule overall is polar or nonpolar. A little bit about why we care, what properties of that molecule those things, the polarity effects. Now, in chemistry, the word polar is referring to if something has a separation of charges where one side of that thing, whether it's bond or molecule, has a small positive charge and one side has a small negative charge. Polar meaning like poles of a magnet. And this happens in bonds and in molecules when electrons are not shared evenly between two atoms then it can have a slight negative where the electrons spend more time and a slight positive where the electrons spend less time. Now with just bonds being nonpolar covalent or polar covalent, we're talking about just the bond between two specific atoms, not an overall molecule yet. And these are both covalent bonds, and so they're both sharing electrons, which means that they're typically going to be two nonmetal atoms. Now, polar means that it would have poles like a magnet with a slight positive pole and a slight negative pole. Nonpolar, though, means that it doesn't have a slightly negative or a slightly positive side. And so if polarity occurs because the electrons are shared unevenly, then a nonpolar bond is one where the electrons are shared evenly. And so there are no poles or no partial negative or partial positive sides of this bond. The property that influences if the two atoms are going to share electrons equally is called electronegativity. Electronegativity is how much the atoms of an element pull electrons to itself, and if they have the same property or the same value for electronegativity, it means that neither of the two atoms in the bond pull the electrons more than any other. Polar is the opposite. A polar bond is where the electrons are not shared evenly, or they're shared unevenly. And it's because the two elements do not have the same electronegativity, but one has a higher value for electronegativity. One pulls electrons more than the other. And so what happens is the one that pulls electrons more, the one with the higher electronegativity, will have a slightly negative charge. The electrons are spending more time at that atom and the electrons are negative. And so that atom will have a slight negative charge, not a full one minus, but a partial negative charge. The one that has a lower electronegativity, the electrons will spend less time around the atom with a lower electronegativity. And so it will have a slight positive charge. It's slightly deficient in electrons. It hasn't lost them completely, so it won't have a full one plus charge, but it will have a slightly positive charge. 
Now these symbols here are Greek lowercase deltas and delta negative, delta positive. That means slightly negative. It means not a full one minus, but a partial negative charge. And delta plus means that it is a slightly positive charge, not yet a full one plus charge. We're gonna look at how this would work with a couple of examples. Two hydrogen atoms, they each have an electronegativity of 2.2, and so neither one of these would pull electrons more than the other. The electrons would exist evenly between them. And because the electrons are shared evenly, though I'm drawing them right in the middle, remember that they are orbiting both, but they're orbiting them evenly. And so this is a nonpolar bond. There is no difference in electronegativity between these two atoms. Now, if you look at a periodic table or a reference, you can see that the value on this reference for hydrogen is 2.1. Sometimes you'll see it as 2.2. And the value for chlorine is 3.0. And so there is a difference here. And the chlorine has a higher electronegativity. The chlorine pulls electrons more. And we're going to draw that as the electrons being slightly over toward the chlorine not in the middle, and the chlorine will have a slight negative charge. Between a hydrogen and an oxygen atom, the previous reference gave the electronegativity for oxygen as 3.5, and so this is still 2.2 or 2.1. The electrons are pulled more to the oxygen. And with hydrogen and fluorine, fluorine being the most electronegative element, the electrons are going to spend much more time orbiting the fluorine, and we're going to draw them almost completely off of the hydrogen and almost completely on the fluorine. Depending on what reference you look at, the values for electronegativity difference are going to be a little bit different. You might, in one instance, see that anything with an electronegativity difference between atoms of 0, 0 0.0 and 0 0.4 is nonpolar. And then from 0 0.4 to 1.0 would be weakly polar. From 1.0 to 2.0 would be strongly polar. And then anything over 2.0 would be considered an ionic bond. There's no longer any sharing of the electrons. Other references might have slightly different values. For instance, another reference I looked at said these values being given for nonpolar, weakly polar, strongly polar, or ionic. But really, if you're trying to figure out as if something is polar or ionic, just remember that ionic is typically a metal bonded with a non-metal. Now last week you should have looked at how to take a diagram of a molecule and determine its shape using model kits or simulations or a reference chart. We're going to use those shapes of molecules to determine if they are symmetric or not because if a molecule is symmetric or not determines if the entire molecule is polar or not. So for a molecule to be symmetric in 3D, it has to be the same if it is flipped along any axis. Now the reason why we looked at model kits or the references about how molecules exist in 3D is because you might draw a water molecule like this. And it would look symmetric. If you looked at the left and right sides, they look the same. And if you looked at it top and bottom, it looks the same. However, when you build this, it ends up looking like this. And so it's only through building it 
or looking at the reference about their actual 3D shape, that you would see that a water molecule is bent shape, that it is not symmetric. It might be the same on the left and the right, but top and bottom, it is not the same. And the reason this is important is because a molecule may have polar bonds in it, but if it's symmetric, the polar bonds cancel each other out. So we'll look at an example of how that works. CO2 is an example of a molecule that is symmetric, yet it has polar bonds. We could analyze these polar bonds looking at the electronegativity difference between carbon and oxygen. Carbon is 2.5 and oxygen is 3.5. And so the electrons in these bonds are going to be pulled closer to the oxygen, are going to spend more time with the oxygen, and the oxygen will be slightly negatively charged. We draw arrows to indicate that. They're called dipole arrows, where the arrow is pointing toward the more electronegative element, and it has a plus sign at the end of the arrow that is more toward the less electronegative element. In this case, this oxygen is also pulling electrons toward itself. Now we can see that while each of these two bonds is polar, that they perfectly cancel each other out. This is a symmetric molecule, and the entire molecule is nonpolar. There's no part of this, there's no side of the molecule that is slightly negative and slightly positive. It's got two ends that are slightly negative. We'll look at our example of water before that is not symmetric. It has polar bonds between the hydrogen and the oxygen. The electronegativity for hydrogen being 2.1 or 2.2, depending on the reference, and the electronegativity for oxygen being 3.5. To draw dipole arrows for these bonds, they would be going from the hydrogen, which pulls the electrons less, and pointing toward the oxygen. Now these two dipole arrows seem like they might be opposing. They really are only opposing in the x-axis, but they are not countering each other in the y direction. And so these do not cancel out. This is not a symmetric molecule. And overall, this molecule does have a slightly positive side at the bottom and a slightly negative side at the top. And you could draw for the entire molecule a dipole arrow showing that. Now, if molecules are composed of nonpolar bonds, it doesn't matter if they are symmetric or not, they are going to be nonpolar molecules. And so this molecule, pH3, a pH bond is nonpolar because the electronegativity for hydrogen is 2.1 and for phosphorus is 2.1, and so the electrons are shared between these evenly. And despite it being asymmetric, it is still going to be a nonpolar molecule because of that. There would be no dipole arrows drawn on this because there's nothing to show the electrons being shared unevenly. Similarly, the difference in electronegativity between carbon and hydrogen is so low that it is considered to be a nonpolar bond. This is also symmetric. I drew it in 3D here, and it would be a nonpolar molecule. Now, the reason we care about if molecules are polar or not is because it impacts their properties that we can see. If molecules are polar, they have a slightly negative side and a slightly positive side, and so this water molecule would actually stick to other water molecules around it. 
and it would influence if it is a solid liquid or gas at different temperatures. Things that are polar are more likely to be solids or liquids at moderate temperatures. Things that are nonpolar are more likely to be gas because these molecules would not stick to each other. They would bounce off of each other. And with these four examples, we see that in real life, that at room temperature, CO2, being a nonpolar molecule, is definitely a gas. At room temperature, H2O, a polar molecule, is liquid. At room temperature, pH3, called phosphine, is a nonpolar molecule, and that is a gas at room temperature. And CH4 is methane. It is a nonpolar molecule and is a gas at room temperature. So I hope that was all clear enough. We'll work through some examples, we'll build some more models, and you're going to see that you can now go from just a chemical formula to being able to draw a picture, a Lewis dot diagram, to then being able to figure out what shape that would be and analyze its polarity to actually make predictions about if these different molecules are going to have a higher or lower melting and boiling temperature just based on their formula now. We'll see that through some examples when we build models of these and you're going to make some predictions and then check your predictions by actually looking up the melting and boiling points of a few different compounds that you've analyzed.